Welcome folks to the A Minute to Midnight show. My name's Tony and I'm coming to you from New Zealand and this is brought to you by a minute to midnight.com. I have two people on the show with me today. Our first time guest Deanne Loper and my friend Joni Stahl. So Joni, it's great to be chatting to you today and I'll let you introduce Deanne. Yeah, thanks for having me on again, Tony. I was really looking forward to this particular interview today with Deanne Loper, who is with us right now. So I'm going to go ahead and welcome you on as a guest to Minute to Midnight, um, Deanne. So welcome to this interview on A Minute to Midnight. (laughs) Thank you, Joni. Thank you so much. And hello, Tony. I appreciate you both having me on. It's an honor to be on with you tonight. And it's an honour to have you too. Um, And it's going to be a subject today that I want to let people know straight away that both Joni and I are not anti-Semitic. So because we're both of Jewish heritage, so um, please bear that in mind when you hear this. Um, We are certainly not anti-Jewish in any way, shape or form. And I'm sure Deanne's not either. So perhaps you'd like to give us a bit of a background, um, Deanne. Thank you. And uh, yeah, I want to reiterate that. Um, no, this this book is in no way meant to be anti-Semitic. It is just a, really an expose of the subject of Kabbalah. And um, the reason I wrote it, well, I'll back up just a bit. Um, I was I was raised in church um, for about 12, first 12 years of my life, I grew up in church and I got away from the Lord and I went into the occult for about 11 years and I had a very profound uh, born again experience at the age of 24 and um, the Lord delivered me out of new age, deep occultism, Hinduism, reincarnation beliefs, uh, yoga, I mean, you name it, witchcraft, uh, forms of witchcraft. I was, I was doing that. And like I said, I had a profound um, born again experience. And when I came to the Lord, I just, just devoured the word of God because what I've always said is people who are into these experience, they're, they're searching for the true light. Jesus is called the true light. And the counter, one of the counterfeit lights is Kabbalah. In fact, the, um, the Zohar, the main book of Kabbalah, is, it means a uh, book of splendor or book of light. So for the first uh, many years, I'd say 15, 20 years, I researched the New Age infiltration into the church. And I began with um, New Age authors uh, like Helena Blavatsky, Alice Bailey, uh, David Spangler, Benjamin Krim, some of the more well-known uh, leaders in the New Age movement. And what I noticed was uh, just about every book I ever read, those uh, authors or leaders in the New Age would touch on Kabbalah. And I began to, through that, you know, recognize, I was already recognizing terminology that was coming into the church because what people like Alice Bailey said very uh, forwardly, that they were going to infiltrate Christianity and destroy it from within. So I could see the terminology. It started like that way. I could recognize it. And then, like I said, um, I noticed this stream of Kabbalah running through all these occult books. So that's when I started to begin the research into that part of it. And that's why I wrote the book. Can you um, tell the listeners the name of the book? My book is called Kabbalah Secrets, Christians Need to Know. And there's a subtitle, An In-Depth Study of the Kosher Pig and the Gods of Jewish Mysticism. Great. Joni, um, have you got anything that you'd like to add in here? Yeah, you know, I was really um, excited to hear your first interview that you had on Steve and Yana's show. And the reason being is because I remember way back in the early 90s, like 1990, 91, 
I was already studying this and it was right at that time. And, you know, of course, we'll get into this later, but, you know, I was, I was studying about the Kabbalah or Kabbalah, depending how you want to say it. Um, and that was when George Bush Sr. had signed the Noahide laws into, you know, uh, laws of our nation. And that just really kicked off a major study with me. And of course, I have a really in-depth background of Freemasonry study that was a 10-year launch. And it was a very in-depth 10-year research, which was very interesting because when you get to learn those words like you were talking about from uh, Madame Blavatsky and Alice ba Bailey and their theosophic comments, beliefs, and ideologies – you see them as a strong backbone to Freemasonry and all and all the Kabbalistic language is replete. It is completely soaked in even what I would call today a Zionist Christian rhetoric. I just um, I'll leave you two to, to to most of the talking, but I just want to say here before I do that how many times I've mentioned in videos the as above so below symbolism that we're seeing everywhere infiltrating Christian circles and including that saying itself being in um, the message translation of the Lord's Prayer. And whether which come first, the chicken or the egg, no one can be sure on the dates of either the Emerald Tablet or the Book of Zohar, but that comes straight out of both of those, and that's right there, you know, smack bang in the middle of Bethel and a whole lot of other places as well as the mo at the moment. And I think the Book of Zohar is going to be uh, <laughs> definitely a part of this conversation. So I just wanted to mention that to people. Be really, really careful as soon as you start seeing that. This is where it's all coming from. Deanne. Yes, um, both of uh, what what you both said were um, just cue points for me to deepen my research. I came across the Noahide laws early in my research. Uh, it was um, shocking, you know. While everybody was talking about um, Islam, here's these laws that were kind of were much more hidden back then in the '90s, Joni. I mean, they were hard to find, and when I found them. I didn't even want to believe it. Like I was looking at it online, but I said, I've got to see this for myself. And there's a little story here. I was looking for the actual um, original quote from the book of Sanhedrin out of the Babylonian Talmud. And I couldn't find it online. And if I did, I didn't even know if I would trust it. And I was up doing the research one night at two or three o'clock in the morning, and the Lord spoke to me. He said, go to the uni university library. Because I, I'm telling this story because some people still don't believe that these laws are actual laws or that they've actually been written or that they even exist in the Babylonian Talmud. And when the Lord spoke that to me, he said, go to the university library. And I was just like, of course. I called the library. I have a, a state university that's close to me. And that's where I get quite a few of my books from uh, universities. I have to order some of them for the research because they're hard to get your hands on. The Babylonian Talmud is hard. to. It's like 26 mm -hmm. volumes. I go there. Oh, I called them and they did have a set. And sure enough, I looked it up, and there were the laws written right there in the Babylonian Talmud. And like you said, Tony, the as above, so below. I mean, just so much of this New Age terminology was coming in. So I, like I said, I started to look more into Kabbalah itself because I just knew that there had to be something more to it. And uh, hearing like the connection, like you said. Uh, Joni with Freemasonry, and I had read the the quotes uh, by Albert Pike that said um, Freemasonry is Kabbalah, and Lucifer is the light of Kabbalah, and you can't really know Freemas Freemasonry or get to the level without that light of Lucifer. And Helena Blavatsky said the same thing that Lucifer. She said Lucifer is the harbinger of our light. 
So we have this stream. Kabbalah is the false light, and it's connected to Freemasonry and theosophy. Yeah, you know, it is. And the, the thing that we're dealing with is spiritual power. And the lights that we're talking about are power. And they are power. You know, of course, when you look at Kabbalistic, you know, that light is satanic. Of course, theosophists are going to say, well, we don't believe in a literal Satan. But in the study of Kabbalism, you know, when I started doing it, I went straight to the roots. Like when I first heard about it, like Deanne, I think we talked about this before, is I'm okay. I came from a Jewish family. I have a strong Jewish background, really strong. And when I became a Christian, I mean, of course, I went through some kind of a Christian, like an identity crisis, you know, until I really, I mean, I was fully identifying with Jesus, but then there was a, still this Jewish part of me, but then that was all worked out. And I don't want to make this about myself at all, but I'm just saying that when I got to the point where I absolutely was, I'm a full born, full born again, Christian. And as I was going into studying it, I had to really wrestle. And I know that there had to be a wrestling with you because, you, of course, I know that because you said that when you start really studying Kabbalism and you go to the roots of it, that you're going into the roots of ancient Babylonian mysteries. You know, they're, 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 it was a mystical Babylon because there was a full, you know, born, I'm getting my words on mixed. I had a long day today, so you guys forgive me. Um so, I mean, wasn't there a wrestling with you where you're like, is this for real? Like, and you're knowing as you're researching, you're like, but it is you, you're, I mean, I got my hands on books that were from the real deal, you know, even secular as well as doctors of our, you know, Christian um, faith. And they were bringing these things to light back in the day in the early nineties for me. And I really had to wrestle with that. I mean, wasn't there a great wrestling with you to say, is this for real? Oh, yeah. It, and it was even scary at times um, because when you try to, when the Lord is showing you these things, you know, you, you first of all, you need to, uh, I tell people, look, there's been so much deception in in the church. We can talk about the Schofield Bible and all of that, but um, most people are becoming aware of that. But the love of the truth is key. And that's all I did. I just was, I started with a clean slate. I said, Lord, you know, I was raised in dispensational theology and my stepfather who raised me was a Freemason. And I said, you know, he's passed away. Uh, he was a great man, but that's what he believed. And I just started with a clean slate. I said, Lord, I don't care whatever I've heard. I just, I set it all aside and I want the truth no matter what it is. And I think a lot of people are, are fearful of that. You know, um, I've encountered that with friends and you can, you and I, Joni talked about this. I mean, you can lay all the evidence out there as clear as day and they just won't discuss it. They just won't go there. Um, we talked about the scripture, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And, you know, the, well, the powers that be have really done a good job of taking that scripture and almost using it as a psychological weapon in the church because Christians are so terrified to even approach this subject because of that one scripture. But I say, look, there's, there's nothing wrong with asking God questions. <laughs> there's nothing wrong with seeking the truth. In fact, we're encouraged to be Bereans. And so, but yes, to answer your question, I, there were nights when I was just terrified or I would be reading the Bible and then God would just, I mean, the Holy Spirit would just illuminate a scripture to me, like Revelation 11, 8. Um, Their dead bodies shall lie in the streets of the great city, which is called Sodom in Egypt. And I was just, I had never seen it before. I said, oh my, I said, that's Jerusalem, because it says where our Lord was crucified. And then if you keep reading 
in Revelation 17 and 18, Mystery Babylon is always called the great city. So this was like one of the first things, the first truths that the Holy Spirit showed me. And then I would wrestle. I was like, oh, Lord, this can't be. This can't be. It's got to be Rome. It's got to be America. It's got to be this or that. But, you know, as hard as that is to say, the Bible confirms itself. The great city is the great city. The great city is Mystery Babylon, where our Lord was crucified. So those were, I had a lot of really times of wrestling with the Lord with scriptures like that. And I would say just, Lord, you've got to, you know, confirm and confirm again and again. So it was a, it was a process of time. I guess there's going to be people that will listen to this that are going to not think that Jerusalem is Mystery Babylon. Um, and... I, I understand that. To, to me personally, I'm not totally sure whether it is or isn't. Um, so, but, but aside from that, whether people think that Jerusalem is Mystery Babylon or not, just put that to one side and, and let's delve into some of the other aspects of this because it is huge. And um, yeah, I think it's an eye, it'll be a real eye opener for people. Well, I wanted to say that, you know, the, the, when, it's, when it says that the two witnesses lie dead in the street for three days, it says it is figuratively called Sodom and Egypt, and it's a connotation of the spiritual condition of what it will, and is, even at this time now, has become. I mean, when you look at Israel right now, that is overran by the LGBT community. You know, we look at the gay pride marches. So we can even say that is Sodom spiritually, correct? And, you know, when you say Egypt, well, it's the spirit of Egypt. It's the spirit of Babylon. So I think that we can be as much as conclusive as possible to say that that is not mystery Babylon Period, because there's a literal Babylon, there's a historical Babylon, there is a mystery Babylon, but that is not it. That has its own designation. So that's that's what I wanted to say because I wanted to clear that up. And of course, sure. we, I just oh, I just want to add, we know that the you know, for example, the Supreme Court in um, in Israel, a, a Rothschild design that's full of basically Freemasonic symbolism and all of that. So it's definitely in there and there's all this other mysticism and stuff that's going on there. So Deanne, maybe we should dump, jump into a little bit. People might be wondering what this mysticism is. Yes, and, and when I say that, I mean, I want to, I just want to connect that to just going back because, you know, I've always viewed the Jewish people as the chosen of God. So I didn't mean it in a way that lumping all of Jewish people into that, just that spiritual connection, even with Israel, because it's just something that I've never heard, you know, the spiritual connection of it. And that system of mysticism underlies pretty much all nations and all governments. So just to clear that up, um, but I will, okay, so let's move on here. Um, one of the first, this again is a, why I wrote the book or what really intrigued me to write the book. One of the first um, books that I got in my research was a book by uh, Rabbi Joel David Baxt. And it was, it's on the secret doctrine of the Guyon of Vilna. And he says in this book, this is the first time I read this prophecy from the Zohar, that there was an actual prophecy that talked about this uh, timeline of when their Messiah would come in. And I'm talking about the Kabbalistic, according to the Kabbalist, their timeline. And I just will read that. It says, in the 600th year of the sixth millennium, which they've got the date here as 1840 uh, CE, which is common era, or AD 1840, which would have been the time around the Industrial Revolution. The gates of wisdom above, which is Kabbalah, together with the wellsprings of wisdom below, which is science, will be opened up. 
and the world will prepare to usher in the seventh millennium. So according to the Kabbalah, there are in the Zohar, this is actually from the Zohar, I discovered that there was an actual prophecy and a timeline that they were operating on, and that really uh, cued my cued my interest into further research. Yeah, you know something. I'm. Um, it's it's really when you start studying Kabbalism, it it will take you on. It's like one thing after another, and I want to inject the Lord in this right now because obviously this prophecy would even pretty much speak about the time that we're in right now, right? Because we're at the end of the 6,000th year. And really, if you're going to really get into, you know, prophetic times and seasons, that we're at the very end of the day of man. The last, right, because the sixth day would be the day of man. So that would answer to what that prophecy is that you're speaking about and that seventh day that's coming, which is so interesting because I noticed that all those Kabbalistic prophecies, not all of them, but so many of those Kabbalistic prophecies are actually very parallel to many of the prophecies that are spoken about, like in Daniel, in Ezekiel, a lot of them in Ezekiel, Isaiah, because really, um, and I want to talk about this book, it's called, and I just want to just, you know, inject it here at this moment, because really what they want to bring about these prophecies they want to bring about is a Jewish utopia. Right. And there's a book that, called the Jewish utopia. Yeah, yes, that's correct. And I, I, I bring some quotes uh, into my book from that book. Uh, that's a book written by um, Michael Higger. And it's really interesting um, because what I, what I try to say in, in my book, um, and, there, and there may be some differences of opinions on this, but the kingdom of God, according to Jesus Christ, Jesus said the kingdom of, of heaven is within you. Um, he said, as he was standing before Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. Uh, Paul, the apostle, said that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So, one of the things that Jesus said to his disciples in Matthew 24, he said, if they say the Christ is here or there or in the desert or the secret chambers, don't go. Do not follow them. And so my, what I put out there to people is, is simply, look, um, this, this utopian uh, kingdom that they're trying to create, it is exactly what – the uh, Pharisees and the rulers at the time of Jesus were expecting him to do at that time, that they were expecting a political uh, military type Messiah who would overthrow the Roman kingdom. And Jesus didn't do that. And, you know, when the Lord returns, I don't think that any of us really understand how that's going to happen. But, it, you know, if if they're trying to bring forth their Messiah, and they are, you know, we can see that through this. They're very, very dedicated and serious about it. How would we know him if he told us, don't, don't go? Because he said, as the lightning flashes forth from the east to the west, that's how the Son of Man shall come. And so we just need to be very careful um, when they're talking about prophecy. And, uh, you know, much of prophecy has been fulfilled and there are still things that are yet to be fulfilled but what i tell everybody is really test you know test test the yeshua test the jesus test the things that they're presenting to you uh, according to the doctrine of the word of god so the messiah that these kabbalistic jews are looking for is what we're going to believe to be, well believe will be the antichrist is that how you see it Yes, I mean it could be it could be the I was just talking to a friend about this today. It could be the antichrist or it could be a antichrist. Um because I'm sure like you Joni are are familiar that Jewish history has a line of false messiahs that have come forth. You know, we've had, there was Simon Bar-Hokba 
after the destruction or right around the destruction of the temple, uh, who claimed to be a messiah. There was Shabbatai Zvi, and he had a following of literally, I think, millions of, of Europeans and um, Muslims in the time that he claimed to be the Messiah. He had a large following, and after that, it was Jacob Frank. And this was all his, this was all centered around these same Kabbalistic doctrines. So, I mean, it's not, it's not for me to say that it could be the Antichrist, but definitely a false Messiah. You know, when you were um, uh, encouraging people to, you know, make sure they have the right Jesus, make sure they have the right spirit, the right gospel. And Paul the Apostle was very clear with us in 2 Corinthians 11, verse 4, where he says, you know, that in, in verse 4, it reads, I don't have it before me. I mean, I can turn to it right now to say it perfectly. But he talks about, let me just get there because I, oh, here it is, 11, verse 4. He says, it says, for if he that cometh preacheth another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit, which ye have not received, or another gospel, which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. And in verses 13, 14, and 15 of the same chapter, it says, but such are false apostles, deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ and no, no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. And we need to talk about Metatron and I want you to talk about Metatron after this. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as ministers of righteousness and shall be according to their works. And when I read this now with the information, I'm thinking, yes, of course, there can be all kinds of false doctrine teachers. We know that's prolific right now. We know that there's millions of people all saying, thus saith the Lord, and this is what the Lord showed me. They're getting a false light. But Paul is very significantly, this is during a Jewish, rich Jewish culture. Of course, Corinth was Greek, but he's talking about apostles, deceitful workers, false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming them into angels of light. And, I, you know, I think a lot of people have not heard about who Metatron is. And this is so important because what Tony brought up about an antichrist or the antichrist or their version of Messiah, Mashiach, um, why don't you let everybody that's listening because I love all of your information. I'm enjoying this so much. So let everybody know who Metatron is to the Kabbalists and their prophetic future expectation. Okay, sure. Um, Metatron is a figure that, again, I ran across um, periodically in my research on the New Age movement. At that time, I you know, I, I read it and then I just didn't really understand what a central role that he has in Kabbalah. So as I just dug more into that part of my research, um, okay, I'll, what I'll do is I'll start with, um, if you read the back description on the back cover of my book, I say that if you follow this mystical Judaism, again, we're talking about the mystical Kabbalistic Judaism, Judaism, it is going to take you not to the God of the Bible, but another God. So where I started was with the, the, the formation or the emanation of the Sephirot tree. And above that Sephirot tree, which I discuss in my book, there's an unknowable, ineffable God called Insof. And how the Kabbalistic uh, creation story goes is that he created Keter, which is also Elohim, which is the God of our Bible. And then from Keter come down these nine emanations or these spheres. So you've got Hakma, Bina, all the way down to uh, in the center of the, the Sephirot tree is the 
what they call Metatron's cube. And this is where Metatron stands at the center of this Sephirot tree in the Kabbalistic universe. Uh, Rabbi Bax says of Metatron that he stands in the center of the universe with the name of Israel engraved on his forehead. Okay, He is the holder of the keys of knowledge. And he is the one that these mystical rabbis or even occultists have claimed to see him as they meditate on the Kabbalistic uh, 72 names of God. It's interesting that there's supposedly in Kabbalah, I think it's 72 mystical names of God. Well, Metatron also has 72 different names. And in my book, I, ta- I think I quote Gershom Sholem says that these, all these names are, by the Kabbalists are, are intermingled, these sacred names of God and these different names of Metatron. So as they ascend, it's Metatron that they encounter on the throne, seated in this cube or in his chariot. And Metatron is considered the little Yahweh in the third book of Enoch and some of these other um, mystical writings. It's called Merkaba mysticism or chariot mysticism. And so, I mean, I, I understand. I understand how, you know, people can be deceived in the occult. But what another reason that really prompted me to write my book is because I had never seen this kind of doctrine come so boldly and so blatantly into the church. And like I talk about this book, The Return of the Kosher Pig, and it's not that I want to pick on Mr. Shapira, but he actually does list, he has Metatron in his book, The Return of the Kosher Pig, as one of the names of Messiah, but this comes, again, this comes from Kabbalistic mystical writings. And he quotes, he quotes a lot of these in his book. And so that, to me, is when the church is at that level and you have so many Christians following these teachings, that, that's a serious, serious place for the church to be today. You know, I wanted to bring something up about the Sephirot tree and the Sephirot tree. Um, I did a lot of research in that. That was a long time ago. And I, I'm, I'm going to try to remember as much as I can, because my research was like, of course, in Freemasonry and absolutely throughout entire Freemasonry. They constantly have they're ta- they, the word, Kabbal- you know, the Kabbalah. Um, words from the Kabbalah, you know, and I had my hands on certain books I was reading um, that were from the Sanhedrin and that were only and absolutely given like to the third master Masons. They were given a special book um, from the Kabbalah. And I read some of the things in there and it was so evil. But one of the things, you know, we're talking about how things bleed into the Christian um, verbiage, so to speak, okay? And one of the things that are part of the Sephirot tree, which is Jacob's ladder, it's an ascendancy. And there's like, I think, what is it, 22 paths? There's like 22 paths. You basically, this Metatron, you have to ask him for degrees. You have to, you know, go by degrees up this ladder where you basically become deified. And, but the word Shekinah, I mean, how often do we hear Christians go, oh, that's the Shekinah glory. Like, you know, when they're reading in the Old Testament and, you know, the part where Solomon, he gets finished building, you know, he has the temple built and when it was all completely done, all the singers were done singing. It said that this you know, talked about the, the light coming in and everything. And I remember all my life being taught, oh, well, that's the Shekinah glory. Well, I did. I just bought it that it was like, OK, well, it's obviously this this glory of God called the Shekinah. And so you hear that word being said all the time. And so if you don't mind me reading this little part in your book, because it's so good, it is just short. 
the word Shekinah is not found in the Bible. These are your words. <laughs> in Kabbalah, Shekinah is the final Sephirah to emanate from the Sephirah tree. She is the female counterpart of Ein Sof and the divine presence of God in the earth. She is the daughter conceived in the sacred marriage of Hieros Gamos. She is the gateway of man's ascension to knowledge, the bride and queen of Tepharet. She is the mother who is one with the children of Israel. But something went wrong with this cosmic drama. There is a crisis, a shattering of God's dream in which man is not left to work and pick up the pieces. And so basically there's a male and a female counterpart side as you were showing in your book. I hope everybody gets this book because this is an excellent work that you did. And so why don't you go ahead and explain the male, female androgynous because we can look at, what is that, two horn, uh, you know. Um, Half me. Thank you, Baphomet, who's androgynous, right? He has breasts, but he's male. So this all comes from that. So please explain the duality and male female of sephirot sure okay so when uh when insof now he's not actually one of the spheres on the uh sephirot tree but he's above it and when he first emanates okay there's a, a process called zim zoom <laughs> TZI, TZIM, TZUM, I think it is, where the Kabbalists say that God was um, filling the universe, but he had to contract himself into a point of light. And from there, he emanated from himself this catcher, which is, um, again, Elohim. So right there, that goes against the book of Genesis, because in Genesis, Elohim is the creator, but Ketcher or Elohim was androgynous, according to the Kabbalah. And I've got plenty, I've got, I think I've got 241 footnotes in the book. So it's, you know, it's not just my words, it's really just researching and documenting. So Ketcher is androgynous, male and that? female. Can you spell that Keter so people can know? <laughs> Sure. K-E-T-E-R. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And that means uh, Supreme Crown, uh, also Elohim. Is you'll see you'll see different forms of this Kabbalah Sephirot tree. Um, so from Keter emanates Hakma and Bina. Now Hakma is the male pillar there's three pillars and we're and this you can relate this even to the pillars of freemasonry mm -hmm. so you've got the male side and from keter comes hakma which stands for wisdom and then the female is bina and actually um in kabbalah in in the return of the kosher pig book bina is related to jesus or yeshua even though it's a female characteristic of this androgynous God. And then the Hieros Gamos is where these two entities, and, and I'd stress this in the book, these spheres are actually actual living entities. They're crowns. Um, they're probably fallen angelic beings because there's angels standing at each one of these gateways. And in Kabbalah, Kabbalah teaches that there's seven heavens instead of three. Mm -hmm. So it, it really is a whole different uh, cosmology creation, even redemption is completely different from the biblical view. So Hakman and Bina come together in sexual union. That's called Heros Gamos. And then they, they have this union. And from this sexual union comes the next Sephirot, the next two. And then they have sex all the way down. I mean, it gets pretty um, graphic, but like the, the um, and, and Rabbi Bax gets pretty, pretty clear and graphic in his book. But the last sphere, all these spheres are in the spirit world, but the bottom one, the last one is Malkut. And that means kingdom. And that's, that's our 
planet Earth. That's the only sphere that's not supposedly located. Well, it's not. It's not located in the spirit world. And that's where you have your Shekinah. And there's an interesting um, quote in my book from the Zohar. It's actually quoted from Gershom Sholem's book, where at that when when Ensof emanated these spheres, the light, which by the way is very interesting, that's the Vav, the V-A-V, the, the mystical Hebrew alphabet comes into play here in a big part of Kabbalah. So when he, the Vav or the light in, that went into these spheres was so bright that these spheres, these spheres shattered. And so part of God, which would be the Shekinah, fell into the pit or the abyss. And she is waiting to come out of the abyss. And so, you know, all I can do is compare. We can compare these things to parts of the book of Revelation and just go, wow. (laughs) You know, know, um, I want to bring something up, which is really interesting, because you talked about the seven gates of heaven and their seven doors. And, you know, isn't it interesting how people always like, oh, I'm in seventh heaven. Like it's even braided into you know, common everyday language and people do not realize what they're saying. And interestingly, many years ago when I was researching and I was all over the place because when I was studying Freemasonry, when you study Freemasonry, you think you're just going to study one thing like, oh, this is who they are. This is what they believe. This is what they do. No way. I mean, it could take a lifetime of study and you could have like, like for instance, like at the fifth degree, there's like five or 10 other 15 maybe I think other degrees that come out of the fifth degree and then there's you know different you know like uh French Freemasonry with the 164 degrees and you know there's aluminous degrees and everything and um but I want to say something about that the seven heaven the seven doors and the seven heavens is I was reading and um uh studying things that were so deep in Freemasonry that people would be mind blown. And they also get into heavy sexual graphic things, just like Kabbalism, which is tied to it, which is so pornographic. There's no way that I would even think to mention a word here. Um, But also too, um, there is a heavy witchcraft arm of Freemasonry, which they would say, well, we don't practice witchcraft. But but they they do get into heavy stuff that is nothing less than witchcraft. And something I learned is in black magic and heavy black black magic, there is a I don't know if you heard about it or not. It's called the Necromonicron. Have you heard of that? I have heard of it. I haven't really looked into it. But I've heard of it. Well, to witchcraft communities that practice that, that want really high level power. Um, The research that I did on that is that there are 13 levels of heaven and there are 13 gates, which is interesting because everything lines up with that Kabbalistic Sephirot tree. And so they believe that there are 13 gates, which they don't call heaven. They call hell, but it goes upwards, of course. And that every door, every gate that you go through, you have to engage a specific fallen angel and you have to say certain things and you have to do what is required of you, but it becomes more treacherous as you get higher and higher and higher. And according to the research I did, um, if anybody even gets to the 13th door, that they are actually killed by Satan himself. So, you know, when you're dealing with the Sephirot tree, you're dealing with, and you would know this better than me because you're, you have fresh insight is that there are fallen angels that you have to engage to ascend that ladder. Is that correct? Yes, I do touch on this in the book and um, yeah, the, it's interesting to me because when I was doing like the new apostolic reformation, new age, and that's just one way, you know, that new age or contemplative mysticism is, is coming into the church. 
uh, came across uh, Richard, Fo- uh, I think it was Richard Foster, who is a big, uh, he's a big proponent of contemplative mysticism. But in his book, okay, so whether you're dealing with, you know, straight up witchcraft, like what you're talking about, or Kabbalah, or something coming into the church that seems just so innocent, like contemplative prayer. He even had warnings in his books. When you go into these altered states of consciousness through this contemplative type of prayer that you and I were discussing uh, yesterday, Joni, there you're going to encounter demonic spirits. You're going to encounter... Um, fallen angels, menacing angels. And in Kabbalah, as you go through these doorways, to get through the doorways, you have to have certain passwords, you know, you have to have certain codes, uh, mystical names. And, you know, the rabbis talk about when you're going through these different levels, that you get this seal, you get the seal of insof on your forehead. I mean, I've got these, I put some of them in my book, these quotes. And so it's like amazing because, you know, some someone had said to me the other day, well, you know, what is what is the mark of the beast? Well, I can't tell you. I don't say this in my book, but what I say is they're admitting that they're getting sealed in the spirit. They're getting stamped with these mystical names, this Aleph Tav. You know, I talk about the Zohar's account of creation. Um, and that was like, that just blew me away. When I, I got this straight out of the Zohar, again, I had to go to the university to, to read it and make sure it was true. So I got a copy of the Zohar. And in the Zohar's account of creation, the letters, the mystical letters, of the alphabet go up before their God in soft one at a time. And they go from reverse order and um, the Tav being the last letter of the alphabet goes up first and says, you know, this is when in is supposedly creating the world. And the Tav says, you know, use me, use me to create the world since I am engraved upon your seal and I'm the last letter in the word truth. And so the insof says to this letter Tav, you are worthy and deserving to for me to use in the creation of the world, but you are destined to serve as a mark on the foreheads of the faithful ones who keep the law from Aleph to Tav, from beginning to end. And so when when I found that, when I read that, it was like a light went on with me that um, really Kabbalah, it deals with a lot of uh, witchcraft and mysticism. But according to Paul, one of the highest forms of sorcery or bewitchment is trying to um, attain righteousness with God through the keeping of the law. In Galatians, Paul says, who has bewitched you? Oh, foolish Galatians, having begun in the spirit, are you now made perfect by the law? And so I I touch on this a lot in my book. And I think that that's important because for people to understand where this mysticism is really heading, at least in the Kabbalah stream, is it's called tikkun, tikkun olam. And when those spheres shattered, man was left to pick up the pieces and we can fix the world through our good works. And just like this uh, account of creation in the Zohar says, the mark of righteousness will be the letter Tav or the Aleph and the Tav, the first and last letters of the Hebrew alphabet. But it says those who keep the law from beginning to end. And so that's where I connected it with the Noahide laws. And so it's the Noahide laws for the Gentiles the 613 commandments for the Jewish people. And if they really believe that if we're all doing our part and keeping the law, then their Messiah will return. I want to jump back, springboard back over to where you just ended. Um, well, we were talking about the seven doors, right? The seven yes. uh, levels of heaven and the seven doors. 
And, you know, Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, that's uh, John 10, verse 1, he that entereth not by the, the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. And I want to say something about that right now, because that Sephiroth tree is absolutely, they look at it like that is the tree of life. That is the return. Man's gaining his own righteousness for the return to the garden. But when Jesus says, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Well, Jesus also says in that same chapter, Satan comes, but for only, only, but for to steal, kill and to destroy. So we know that he is a robber. And another thing too is, um, you know, we always want to look at revelation chapter two, nine and three, nine, where he calls these people out as the liars but he also calls them their apostles liars because they had their own sect of apostleship um and in um let me see here chapter eight jesus says he says uh why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word you are of your father the devil and the less of your father ye will do, for he was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And then he says over here um, that um, they were chiding him about things, but I'm just going to go straight to verse 55 of uh, chapter 10. He says, ye, yet ye have not known him, but I know him, meaning God, his father. If I should say I know him not, I shall be a liar like unto you, but I know him and keep the saying. I believe that at 70 AD, and I think we might have even talked about this before because we've talked a couple times on the phone, but that in 70 AD, when Jerusalem was sacked, um, that all the Jews were scattered, right? So there was all this scattering of the Jews, but that did not, people don't realize, but that did not end the Pharisee movement. They just spread out. And so I think what Jesus was saying here, I could be completely wrong, but when he's talking about him being the door and, you know, in Kabbalistic Judaism, they're saying there's seven doors that you go through of ascendancy because really you're working your own self, your own way, all the way up to being really your own God, you know, and getting back to, and I want you to bring up, cause I know we don't have a lot of time, but um, Adam uh, Kadam, or that was something I wanted to talk about you to bring up because it has to do also with in insoft. And so I know who you're, t the, what I'm, I know, you know, who I mean, uh, about Adam Kadmon, the yes. first emanation or creation of Insof. So why don't you talk a little bit about him? Because I think it's important to talk about because we, it's so shifty. You know how Paul, the apostle talks, speaks about the first and the last man, Adam in first Corinthians 15, and it's so, to me, convenient that they came up with their first and last man, Adam. So have at it. Yeah. Okay. Um, yes. Um, I can't remember what page it is on in my book, but um, I show the, um, the Sephiroth tree in the form of the four letters stacked on each on top of each other. The Yod, He, Vav, He. So... There are actually um, two, there's two atoms in the cosmology of Kabbalah. The first atom that emanated from Insof is Adam Kadmon. And you could say that he's also Keter, the one at the top of the Sephirot tree. And he is the one at the, at the first shattering of the Sephirot tree when the spheres supposedly could not hold all the light. He is the one who put the 
universe back together. And again, there's so much symbolism in here with like the mark and the forehead. You know, Metatron has Israel engraved on his forehead. Well, Adam Kadmon, who is really most likely Metatron, there's so many different views here, but through the through lights, through lights coming from his forehead makes me think of the you know Avengers movies or something I think they get a lot of their ideas from here he from lights emanating from his forehead he repaired the worlds and remade the uh the spheres and then he creates Adam the first man in the garden and Adam the man his sin According to Kabbalah, is not that he disobeyed God by eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, but he separated the tree of knowledge of good and evil from the tree of life prematurely. And so, like Rabbi uh, Joel David Baxt actually says that um, through technology and the resurrection of the sacred serpent, you know, and Leviathan. And, and I'll just say that the, the gematria or the, which is numerology, the gematria of the sacred serpent is equal to Mashiach or Messiah in Kabbalah. So this sacred serpent is supposed to resurrect from the dust and the ashes of the fall. And through technology, he will help humanity restore this tree of knowledge. But um, as far as Ad, Adam Kadmon, one of the last things I want to say is, it, um, I think it's on page 99 of my book. There's um, two six-pointed stars. That's another way of uh, expressing the Sephirot tree. So what you see in that, Again, it's through knowledge, salvation, redemption comes through knowledge and good works. And earthly man is a divine reflection, according to Kabbalah, is a divine reflection of this Adam Kadmon in the Sephirot tree. And um, in fact, I've got one quote here that if I could find it real quick, it just kind of blew me away. Let me see. Yes, this is from um, S.L. McGregor Mathers, who translated um, several books of Kabbalah. And he says this. So if when you're looking at that image on page 99 of my book, the, the stacked um, six-pointed stars or shield, Mag and David, they call it in Judaism, which was not the shield of David, by the way. <laughs> it can't be found in the scriptures. Uh, McGregor Mather says, this is the equilibrium of balance. Man's realization of his divine constitution through comprehension of the universal hexad. Uh, the Zohar states that man is a microcosm, a copy or a paradigm of the universe. He is, in his constitution, a reflection of the divine nature. And then it goes in, it talks about the base of the triangle um, and the apex forms the perfect figure of the man. And man begins to conform himself to the image of the Holy One symbolized by the hexagon. And so there, again, the... Um, the six-pointed star, which is Metatron's cube, which is the hexagon, that was all part of my early research. But the more I delved into this, I mean, it, it just runs deeper and deeper. It, there's really I, Kabbalah is like it's an endless maze of knowledge, and there's so much more that I I could have put in that book, but you know, you have to come to a stopping point at some time. This um, interesting too that um, it's made up. The star is made up of two triangles, one pointing up and one pointing down, which is that as above, so below thing again. 
for, for those listeners that are going, well, what has this got to do with us? Because that's just some little small sect over in Israel. It's this Kabbalah thing, you know. What has it got to do with us? Uh, I think it's probably important that we actually go to, to point to people how this is that infiltrated into Christianity uh, in a big way. Um, that's probably the way we need to really end, you know, the last part of the show, I think, which obviously is going to be longer than normal, um, to really show people how and why it's important for Christians to know this. Okay. Um, in my book, I did kind of a, a critique of the return of the kosher pig. And I had never heard of Rabbi Itzhak Shapira. He got my attention simply because he said that Christianity is Edom and that when Yeshua comes back, he is going to destroy Christianity as an entity. And the only Christians that will be left are those who will assist in building this kingdom of God on earth in Israel and who will help rebuild the temple. And he talks about the animal sacrifices being instituted. He is just one. I've written a paper on my my website, which we can talk about at the end of the the, um, program, which I wasn't able to bring all that into the book. But there are many, I mean, there are many ministers and ministries out there subtly bringing in Kabbalah and I really don't like to mention names, but I'm going to talk about one right now. Um, well, Bill Cloud is one. Bill Cloud, uh, he talks about the Aleph and the Tav um, being the mark, being the mark of righteousness. You know, the Bible says that we as Christians, believers in Jesus Christ, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit until the, the day of redemption. That's our down payment. That's our seal. And it's a circumcision of the heart, Paul, Paul talks about. But so like, um, you know, Bill Cloud, he talks about this Olive Tov. He talks about this force of God. He go, he calls it the Memra. And if you look into that more, the Memra, M-E-M-R-A, that's Metatron. And so I listen to these people and I'm like, this is coming in from all directions. Um, Jonathan Kahn. Jonathan Kahn has a new book that is coming out in September, and it's called The Oracle. Now, in my book, I talk about the harbinger. Um, I knew enough about Kabbalah to know that when Jonathan Kahn's first book came out, The Harbinger, I think it was in 2011, I knew it was Kabbalah. But I didn't know, I don't think I would have recognized what was in this book had I not done the research. Um, Helena Blavatsky says that Lucifer is the harbinger of light. And there's a lot of symbolism. I know I'm, I'm, I'm going to get a lot of flack for this, but I have to talk about it. There's a lot of symbolism on the front covers of Jonathan Kahn's book, including Freemasonry. And the light of Freemasonry know, we know is Lucifer. You have Helena Blavatsky saying that Lucifer is the harbinger of light. In my book... I discuss how the rabbis, and this this concept is hundreds, of th- if not thousands of years old, because it comes right from the Zohar. The rabbis say that the global dissemination, the global spread of Kabbalah is the harbinger. It's the harbinger of Elijah. Now, they're not talking... They're not talking about the same Elijah that we're talking about, because if you look and if you read in my book, this Elijah, this dead Elijah. He's a a familiar spirit. He comes to these rabbis and they go into this spirit realm and they go into these academies and Elijah gives them secrets. But you can read about it in the book that Elijah blowing the Messiah's horn, blowing the horn of the shofar is the harbinger. Okay. And this is the necessary step to actually initiate the masses into Kabbalah, that's what they believe is the necessary step before their Messiah comes. Um, there, was a, there was a video, a YouTube video out circling, it's still on YouTube, of 
Jonathan Kahn speaking. It's called The Zohar Speaks. And he is telling the people, he's talking about Golgotha. And he's telling them that that's Golgotha, the skull hill where Jesus Christ was crucified. That's not, that is not Golgotha. Golgotha, uh, Golgotha, sorry. Golgotha is actually that top part of the Sephirot tree. On page 99 of my book, it's the Arik on pen. And that's called the long face. And it's, it, it's described in detail in the Zohar. That's the long face of God. Metatron in the other in the bottom cube is the short face. He's the lesser Yahweh. So you have these three spheres at the top that make up the Golgotha. And the Zohar talks about this dew dripping down on myriads of worlds. And Jonathan Kahn goes into this in this video. And he's, he says the Golgotha is the same as Golgotha and that we need to listen to the rabbis. Um, Jonathan Kahn has a book of mysteries. There is an actual book of mysteries that falls under the umbrella of Kabbalah. And had I not done the research, I was, I was sharing with Joni, you know, after I finished my book, I went and got the Harbinger just to check it out because I never did read it. And when I opened it up, the Aleph and the Tav, which the Zohar says is the mark of the righteous, is imprinted on the table of contents page, and it's imprinted in very light ink in, uh, at the top of every chapter page. And this book, The Harbinger, is done as a story. It sounds real good because it's talking about coming judgments and repentance, but encoded in this book are there there's nine seals and this this person has to decode these seals and the first seal is the vav and i i don't have time to go into it right now but the description of what's on this seal is exactly as the vav the pillar of light that's the middle pillar that emanates from insof it comes down as a ray of light and then splits and it forms the v and it breaks through the wall and i mean it, just the similarities are are really amazing so that's just one that i you know that tony to answer your question it's a long explanation but this Kabbalah is coming in. It's coming in through the door of the new apostolic reformation. It's coming into the door through the emergent churches, like you and I talked about, Joni, through contemplative mysticism, the purpose-driven movement. That tree on the front of Rick Warren's purpose-driven book, that is the Kabbalistic tree with the roots penetrating the ground that shows the mysteries and there's a very good book, a very good book written by uh, Roger Oakland called Faith Undone, and he does an excellent job of tracing Rick Warren's um, mentors and ties all the way back to men like Martin Buber, and Martin Buber is well-known in Kabbalah. I mean, uh, Gershom Sholem writes about Martin Buber and Soren, Kirk, Soren Kirkgaard, and the, these are the men that formed and shaped even Rick Warren's thinkings, thinking. And he has quoted in his Purpose Driven uh, book at least 12 or 13 mystics, um, spiritualists, and occultists. And this is the process that Alice Bailey called overlap. This is how they would get it. They, I mean, they boldly said they were going to do this. In the church, and they've done it through the process of over overlap, introducing occult, new age, kabbalistic authors into Christ, so called Christian books. So that's why we need to be concerned and educate ourselves. Well, that was an excellent answer, and you know, I mean, we can go on because you know, there's other things that we can bring out. But I think you covered it really well by naming like the Emergent Church, the NAR, New Apostolic Reformation. And even the return to Rome, which is something I so wanted to get into, and maybe we can come back another time and discuss about 
you know, the what Rome's part is and the Nostra Aetate, the signing of the Nostra Aetate back in 1962, where the uh, Jewish, uh, you know, uh, Kabbalist uh, rabbis, uh, you know, Chabad Lubavitchers, well, they signed a document with Rome like becoming one with them. And I, I'm saying it like I'm really tired today because I've been working all day long and my mind is kind of mush right now. But, um, you know, uh, Rome has to be brought into this discussion at some point because it cannot be left out because it is one of the major cogs of this machinery. And right now, um, there's all the machines that are running right now when before it was maybe one or two machines running back in the 50s and 60s and so on. But right now, it's like Satan has all these different machines kicked up and they're all running right now. And it's very important to tie in um, the Kabbalistic mystical movement in all of these, you know, like you said, Emergent Church, New Apostolic Reformation, Bethel, and even a recent guest that Tony had on, which was purporting. Um, a full born again, you know, she didn't ever say a born again experience, I notice, but it was a come to Christ. Everything was occultic, new age flowing, uh, reincarnation. And she was very big into reincarnation. And um, she was talking about the oversoul. And that was totally from um, Alice Bailey and her oversoul and you start out with one soul, but then you grow into becoming one entire entity soul of all humanity. And that's complete total Kabbalism. And this one woman has over a hundred thousand followers. And when you look at the comments, they're like, this is so powerful. I never knew this. This is wonderful. So, you know, back to what you said is study your Bibles. But right now, so many people are not going to do that because they want to fast track it. OK, they want to fast track. They want power. They want emanation. They want all that. And one thing I just want to add is I was thinking about something this morning when I was in devotion and it popped into my head and it had to be the Lord because it had nothing to do with what I was reading. And yet, obviously, the Lord knew that I would be here this moment with you and Tony. And I was thinking about how how do you get to all the masses right now that are stampeding to this false light of Satan? Because bottom line, it is the synagogue of Satan. And this is who and we got to come back and talk about it later. But um, but the Lord brought something to my mind. He brought my into my mind Herod, the Tetrarch during Jesus's trial. Jesus was sent to Herod, and we know that Herod, it said of him, that he was happy, like he was excited to see Jesus because he had heard about all these different miracles that he was doing, and he had hoped to see some miracle to be done by Jesus, but Jesus never answered them. And when I heard that in my mind, I, I knew the Holy Spirit was speaking in my spirit, and he said to me, and I'm not saying he gave me word for word. He gave me it like this understanding, like I can see it in, in my, he gave me the spirit of understanding, the spirit of wisdom and insight that I could hear him in, like, if I may put words on it, it was that he was saying to me, Herod represents modern day Christianity. See, they're excited to hear about Jesus. They want to see Jesus. But they only want to see Jesus if they can get something from him, if he can perform some, some powerful miracle. But Jesus didn't speak to him. And so obviously we know Herod and his men of war began, they set Jesus at naught and began to mock him. And the Lord showed me that when, see, the people that have never ever really met the risen Lord, but they just want something from the Lord. They want to get something from him. They want displays of power. That's why they're going to get this false Metatron figure and Antichrist, the Antichrist, whoever you want, that Kabbalistic uh, man, you know, that Adam Kadmon, uh, you know, ultimate man. And isn't that what Satan is bringing about? I mean, that is his masterpiece. 
The Antichrist is Satan's masterpiece, the deification of man. So, Deanne, what have you got? You know, anything that fits in with this that we should really get across to our people um, that are listening before we close up? And once again, too, you must tell people the name of your book and where they can get it as well and your website. Okay. Um, well, yes, I, I just agree with you, Joni. Um, I was reading this morning myself in, in 2 Corinthians 11, where Paul says, I fear that your minds may be corrupted by the craftiness of the serpent from the simplicity of Jesus Christ. So just my, my final word would be to say, yes, we have a real enemy and it's our, our enemy is not flesh and blood, but we need to educate ourselves and we need, I, I'm just, you know, I am a simple word and simple faith Christian, really. And if you continue reading that chapter, you, it, it's amazing because Paul is going to tell you all the things he went through. I think at four times he was beaten with stripes. And I mean, the persecution, persecution comes with Christianity. So what you're saying, uh, Joni, I agree with that. We've got to get back to the simple gospel, the simplicity of Jesus and the word and expect uh, trials and tribulations and persecution. And so um, as far as the uh, book, my book, uh, Kabbalah Secrets, Christians Need to Know, is available on Amazon. Um, or you can access it from my website, which I do have a website. It's There's not a whole lot on there yet because I've been busy. But it's the website is Kabbalah Secrets Christians Need to Know dot com. Same title as the book. Awesome. Yeah. So it's been a really fascinating discussion. And obviously, there's a lot more that we, we could have covered. Um, but hopefully, that's given people a, a bit of a background into at least the importance of knowing where this is going and no doubt at some point we'll have to come back and bring some more information out on this and how it ties in with today. But yeah, I want to thank you both Joni and Deanne for being on the A Minute to Midnight show today in this discussion. And um, it's been really, really great having you. Well, thank you. It was my pleasure being on again and especially to be, um, you know, because really I was just happy to be here because I wanted to hear everything that Deanne wanted to share. So definitely um, that was fantastic. Really good, excellent information and research, Deanne. Well, thank you, Joni. I appreciate you. And Tony, thank you so much for having me on your program. Again, it was an honor to be on with you. God bless you. And no doubt it won't be the last time. So God bless you and and both of you. Um, it's been awesome having you. All right. Good night. Bye-bye. And folks, remember to visit our website, a minute to midnight.com, where you can find all of our shows and articles. And also, if you want to download the free music uh, that I use, my own music in this show, you can do that there as well. And we run A Minute to Midnight 100% by donations. And if you want to help us out, you can donate at our website, and that will be much appreciated too. Uh, that's about it for this episode of the show. It's been a longer one than normal, but hope you've enjoyed it. Click the like button if you're watching it on YouTube and make sure you're subscribed to our YouTube channels and iTunes channels as well. We've had a lot of people unsubscribed against their wishes by YouTube, so just check that you're still subscribed. Until the next show, this is Tony saying God bless and goodbye.